Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, uh, I want to welcome everybody here, certainly the members and, and the folks that are going to chat with us. And I want to remind people that this is a little bit of a different setup. We've had some formal subcommittee hearings. Uh, I'm sorry. I think so. Is that better? Oh, big boy voice. All right. Let me just start over and say, uh, uh, appreciate truly everybody being here, uh, members and, and folks, experts uh, in the field. Want to remind people this is a little different format. Yes, we've had some subcommittee hearings. We'll continue to have some more. Uh, but an event like this, in essence, a roundtable discussion is more for us, the members, to actually listen. Uh, and instead of going, you know, back and forth, back and forth, whatever. Uh, so that's why we wanted to start on time. I'm going to make just a, a couple of uh, opening remarks, uh, identify the folks that are here, and then we'll let them take the ball, and we'll ask questions uh, afterwards. I know I have to leave about 1130, but it'll continue. if it continues after that, that's just fine. That's just great. That's even better. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Diana to get, uh, counterpart in this uh, effort to say a few words in, in a minute. I'm also going to ask uh, Henry Waxman, the, the former chair and, and now ranking member of the full committee, to say a word or two uh, before we start. But we want to keep it to a word or two for all of us. So today, we're continuing our bipartisan 21st Century Cures initiative as we look to learn more about how exciting these new technologies can advance digital health care and the discovery, development, and delivery cycle of new cures and treatments. Of the 7,000 known diseases, we have treatments for only about 500 of them, but we're collectively working to change that. And as we outlined in a white paper released last week, digital health care holds tremendous promise. Yes, it does. By fostering innovation in health information technology, Genomics, data analyx, anal analytics, 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 I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sensors, telemedicine, mobile apps, cloud technology, and other technologies and platforms, we can make our healthcare systems more personalized and proactive, and certainly all the better for patients across the world. We have, again, an all-star lineup for today's discussion. I want to welcome Dr. Jeff Shuren, Director of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the FDA. Dr. Joseph Smith, Chief Medical and Science Officer at West Health. Brian Drucker, Director of the Knight Cancer Center at the Oregon Health and Science University. Gina Gavlek, RN, uh, Chair of the National Advisory Committee for the American Diabetes Association. Sean Hogan, Vice President of Health Care at IBM. Martin Harris, uh, 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 and I heard that Martin was in a uh, cab accident on the way here, but he'll be here shortly. Uh, as Chief Information Officer at the Cleveland Clinic. Ann Wojcicki, uh, CEO and co-founder of 23andMe. Dr. M Mark Blatt, Worldwide Medical Director of Intel. Jonathan Bush, CEO and President of Athena Health. And Paul Magella, CEO of Pervasive Health. So certainly another good crowd of folks for us to listen to. So this digital age offers exciting potential, but we want to understand what obstacles might stand in the way of advancement. We want to hear from all of you and hope that we can use the conversation that we have today to help guide the future of this legislation called 21st Century Cures and of digital health care across the country. I would note to my colleagues that we're here primarily again to listen. Uh, since we launched this effort formally two months ago, We've been encouraged and truly touched by the outpouring of support and ideas. I want to thank those folks who have offered their input already. We've said many times this is a collaborative eff effort. And for folks in the audience and watching at home, you can continue to share your ideas by going to cures at mail.house.gov. Cures at mail.house.gov. And that's mail as in the Postal Service. As this is the digital roundtable, I want to encourage you to, uh, with this effort. Uh, we're we're going to do this uh, also on Century Cures on Facebook at facebook.com uh, backlash energy. Dash, uh, uh, follow us on Twitter. It's all there. Anyway, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Diana Gett, and then we'll go to Henry, and then we'll, 
We'll start with uh, Jeff Sheeran. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm excited about this initiative, and I appreciate you asking me to collaborate with you on it. This, this might be the first effort I've worked on since I've been in Congress where we don't actually have a preconception about what we're going to do before we do it. We've um, had a number, uh, we, this is our second roundtable discussion. We've also had two hearings in the health subcommittee. We have the four white papers. We're taking comments online. We're planning to do some field hearings around the country. And I hope we'll do more hearings in the health subcommittee because that's our, that's our resident expert committee. We've got both Mr. Pitts, the chairman of that committee, and Mr. Pallone, the um, ranking member on that committee here with us today. Um, this is all exciting and, and the, the whole focus, as we've said many, many times, is to take a big picture look at our health care system in this country, the research, the um, approval process, and then how we get it to clinical application to see if we can make it more effective for patients and, uh, and so we can keep our preeminence in the world as the, as the leader in biomedical research. So we're excited about this effort. I like these roundtables because it's a less formal way for experts to come and tell us the issues that they're identifying, and I think that's really important. There are a lot of topics that can fall under the topic of digital health care, telemedicine, the potential for harnessing the vast amount of information collected via electronic health records for research, and the development of mobile medical applications, many, many more um, issues that we want to discuss right here with the experts that we have. So um, I'm eager to hear what the participants have to say. And uh, you're the experts. We're here to listen, to soak it in, and to continue talking as we continue with this initiative. So thanks again, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I will yield back. I'll yield to Mr. Waxman. Thank you for yielding to me. Thank you for inviting me and allowing me just to welcome our uh, participants in this roundtable. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Uh, you're working in an area of medicine which I think holds an enormous potential for the future. And uh, I don't know what we can do to help, but uh, certainly we need to learn. And if there are ways for us to help, we're looking forward to uh, doing it and uh, getting your input. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jeff, you're up. We'll start with you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to uh, to be here today. We're actually um, very excited about it. And I'll say I am personally personally excited about digital health. Um, if you look at where we're headed in the future, you can imagine a world in which um, you know what's actually happening with your parents and children, what's going on in their health today. Not that you have to wait for a doctor's visit. You know if your mom got a good night's sleep, did your dad take his medicine? Was he active today? Um, how is your child's blood glucose? Is it under control? We can know all of that. In addition, we have a world where we can use information on individuals, pull them together, and learn things we could not have learned in the standard way of doing assessments. We can now find opportunities for cures faster at lower cost. That's the way of the future. We have the opportunity to connect technologies. It's going on today. And we can not only share information, technologies can talk to one another. They can actually make themselves smarter. That's the world of the future. Here are some challenges, some considerations as we move first forward. The linchpin for much of this is accurate information. So if we look at understanding what's going on in an individual, and from an FDA standpoint, we have tests, we have sensors. We want to make sure the information is accurate, it's reliable, it's meaningful, because if not, doctors and patients make the wrong decisions. But the stakes are even higher as we move into the world of big data, as we're able to pool large amounts of information and sift through this, not just with the eyes of a human, but with the smarts of analytical software and other technologies. But here, if there are things wrong, if the information is wrong about the individuals when we put it together, we're now wrong about the population. We go after and we develop the wrong cures. Well, we don't develop cures, we miss the opportunities. So first and foremost, accuracy, reliability, meaningfulness of that information. I'd say a second consideration with all these- Could you these pull the mic a little closer? Oh, sorry. I can hear say, most of what you're saying, but not real clear. 
No. Maybe my fault and not yours, but... <laughs> oh, that's okay. The technology is getting there, almost. Um, another consideration, though, is um, as all these different systems are now connecting, we're not just talking about individual technologies, we're talking about systems and systems where they're in systems, is assuring that they're able to talk to one another. Interoperability becomes increasingly more important, um, and that's an issue that we should keep on our radar screen. And I will say from an FDA standpoint, um, we want to engage in smart regulation. That means knowing when to regulate and how to regulate. In this space, I think you've seen we've taken a number of different actions. Um, one is we're trying to provide greater predictability and clarity, but we're also moving out of the way when it makes sense to do so. Last year, in a guidance on mobile medical apps, we not only tried to provide clarity of the kinds of apps, which, by the way, we've been approving for over a decade, and approving software as a medical device for over two decades, but clarifying the ones where we would continue to focus attention. And we didn't expand our footprint. In fact, we took the opportunity to scale it back. We deregulated scores of technologies. And just last week, we announced another proposal to deregulate even more, not actively regulate all those technologies that transfer information from medical devices, store that information, display that information. So here's our goal. Make sure the information is accurate and reliable, and then free it up so that others can use it. Dr. Smith, we're going to go in the same order. So Dr. Smith, uh, Drucker, et cetera. So go ahead. Terrific. Thank thanks. Does that work? I will, thanks. Um, I think we're on the, the precipice of an opportunity to newly kind of reveal and organize our thinking about health and disease. I think we're, you know, if you, if you look back 350 years ago, we newly got the microscope. And 200 years ago, we newly got the stethoscope. And I think now we're at a point where we begin to imagine a data scope of a kind, an opportunity to look broadly across populations and at the same time deeply within individuals. And as one imagines that opportunity to reorganize our thinking and to, to for the first time, have hypothesis-free learning, Right? We don't have to guess and test, but we can observe broadly enormous swaths of information. I think the opportunity to learn hypothesis-free about what's working and what isn't and where our gaps in knowledge should uh, force us to focus our investments going forward, I think that offers a, a remarkable opportunity, if you can imagine kind of a digital zoom lens across the population so that we can do better for the individual, but make sure that we have a learning healthcare system that takes full advantage for you when you are sick of all of the people who were treated yesterday around the country so that we know what's the best way to manage you because we have, for the first time, objectified and looked across all of our experience to help the very next patient. And we have that opportunity. When we talk about what's in the way, I think we've, we've got many things that are kind of naturally occurring and in the way. We don't share information. We don't have smooth semantic interoperability to share information across our experiences as, as physicians and as, as uh, the owners and curators of large data sets. We instead proprietize those things. We, we find business models that mandate keeping them separate, and it frustrates our learning. And when we're spending 18% of GDP on something that, that is you know, now 20% of every family's budget, we ought to be sharing that information for our mutual good. And so the notion of smooth interoperability, seamless flow of information, and not just that information that's currently trapped in, in electronic health records, but all of those smart devices that uh, the good Dr. Shuren approves, we need to make sure that they work together in a sy symphony around patient care and not the current cacophony that exists in our healthcare systems. You know, we desperately need that information to flow s seamlessly at the point of care, but also be amalgamated in a way that fosters our uh, discovery of these new relationships between variables we wouldn't have otherwise imagined, the development of solutions so that we can readily determine what's working and what isn't, because we've got a purview that's no longer based on the 
cottage business of, of medicine, but is instead an enterprise-wide view in healthcare. And then the notion of quickly deciding what's working and what isn't. Where's the editing function for our healthcare system? We've been adding to it. It's a system built by accretion as opposed to design. We've been adding things, but we haven't ever looked back and said, you know what, there's some things we do that simply don't work anymore. You know, when I graduated medical school, they were happy enough to tell me that half the stuff that they taught me was wrong. They just didn't know which half. Well, fast forward 25 years, we still don't know what we're doing that isn't working, but we have the opportunity to learn. And so if we're going to have a learning health system, we need to make sure that that data is available for everyone in the system, that it's, it's readily shared, and that we can learn from it. So I'd, I'd amplify Jeff's point on interoperability being essential. I would say that we don't, you know, we don't know so much have the opportunity to foster it, because as, as the FDA approves each device in isolation, who's minding the shop to make sure that they all play well together? And, and at the moment, um, that's left to the user, and I don't think we're doing a great job. So I look forward to today's comments. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much. I, I do notice that at this round table, we, we're sitting around a square. So I, I, I find that maybe not all the words mean the same thing to everyone, but I'm, I'm looking forward to a delightful day of conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's called the square peg in the round hole. We're doing this right. Right. Brian Drucker. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Upton. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Today is a bit of an anniversary for me. Um, Sixteen years ago today, I was getting ready to give the very first Gleevec pill to a patient in Oregon. And this was a retired railroad engineer who was a willing volunteer in our phase one clinical trial. Six months later, every single one of our patients with a disease, chronic myeloid leukemia, had their blood counts returned to normal. And two and a half years after that, we received the fastest FDA approval of this drug in the entire history of the FDA. Today, because of that work, because of that willing patient, there are now over 200,000 patients alive and well taking a once-a-day targeted pill that zeroes in on the molecular defect that caused this particular leukemia. The reality, though, is that it took us 25 years to identify the molecular abnormality that drove this leukemia and 15 years to develop the drug Gleevec. But let me fast forward for, for you 16 years, and we're starting another clinical trial of a targeted drug for another leukemia. And this work came about because of a patient sample we took in our clinic. We did a whole genome sequencing on this patient sample. We identified the driving molecular abnormality and then realized that this defined another clinical entity called chronic neutrophilic leukemia, which actually only affects about 200 people per year. But we also did drug screening in my laboratory and identified a drug that shut down this molecular abnormality and less than six months after obtaining this patient sample, we've now treated three patients, one a 75-year-old man who had been given months to live, and within three weeks, his blood counts returned to normal. So in six months, we've compressed 40 years of work because of the technologies that we have available to us today. That's what we're talking about here, is the ability to accelerate progress. Now, there's many, many things that are working in this and some things that need improvement as we look forward. So some of the things that we're doing right now around the area of cloud computing, if you think about it, one of the flagship projects of the National Cancer Institute and the National Genome Institute was to sequence about 10,000 tumors, whole genome sequencing. That generated about 2.5 petabits of data. To transfer that data from one institution to another would take you 23 days over the current pipeline. So clearly what we need is cloud computing where we bring the compute to the data rather than having to transfer the data. And if you think about if we were to sequence 10% of every cancer of the 1.7 million patients who develop cancer, that would generate 50 petabytes of data. Well, there's no way we can transfer that data. So we have to think about cloud computing. One of the things I'm proud about is with Intel, with Memorial Sloan Kettering, with MD Anderson, Oregon, the National Cancer Institute has issued a request for proposals for pilot studies of cloud computing. We've partnered to actually make this happen. And we'll hear hopefully in a couple of weeks if our project is selected as one of the three pilots. But the issue is much like Dr. Shuren and others have mentioned, it's about data standards. It's about interoperability, but it's also about scalability. 
How can we make this possible so that in the not too distant future, we could have one million cancer genomes and then the patient in front of us will benefit from all those other patients who've gone before them. So that personalized or precision medicine truly becomes a reality. Now in this future, there are many things that are working. I was just at the National Cancer Institute and heard about the Common Fund, where we're doing big projects with a five to 10 year time frame. And I'm really excited about what's happening there. The National Cancer Institute has just started a, pro a protocol called the Lung Map. This is a protocol with five different targeted agents, several different drug companies working together, several different cooperative groups from the National Cancer Institute working together, and the FDA is waiting on this as well. This is an example of incredible cooperation, and more of this needs to happen. I also want to compliment the federal government for requiring coverage on clinical trials for Medicare patients. This is critical to the success of getting patients on clinical trials. But there are some areas where we can improve. The FDA is doing extremely well with their breakthrough pathway, but I still think there are areas for improvement for getting life-saving medications to patients more quickly. NIH funding can always improve. We're in an incredible opportunity to see progress, and we need more funding to make these breakthroughs happen that I've discussed today. Reimbursements for some of the testing that we're doing. We have the ability to do remarkable genomic testing, but we don't necessarily have the reimbursement infrastructure in place for this to happen. Now, I recognize that we need to prove the utility of our testing, but this is an area where we actually are seeing significant impediments. And lastly, one of the areas where we have to think about is access to this data. And there are certainly some serious privacy concerns and security that we have to address because we have to have access to this data for research so we can actually accelerate progress. So I'm excited about where we are. Lots of things are working. There are certainly some areas for improvement, but we're really pleased to be able to, to bring these issues to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. Gina from the uh, American Diabetes Association. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here today representing the diabetes community, which about two weeks ago, the CDC released their new diabetes statistics, which actually have the numbers continuing to increase with now 29 million Americans having diabetes and another 86 million Americans having prediabetes. And a report was released in 2012 that talked about the economic cost of diabetes, which had gone up 41% from 2007. It had increased to $245 billion annually. Um, as somebody who lives with type 1 diabetes, who has benefited significantly over the advancements that have come about as a result of technology, wearing a continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump, life has really, really changed and improved. But when I was diagnosed in 1980, I was told, just like many people, that the cure was right around the corner. And this has been the longest block that I have ever been on. And when you talked about um, finding finding cures faster is the way that the world is headed. I really hope that that is the case because as we look at diabetes itself, but also the horrifying costly complications that come along with diabetes, this affects everybody. So with one in three of our children and one in two minority children born since 2000 um, being predicted to develop diabetes in their lifetime, we really, really, really need to move forward with what our efforts are in all of the areas, whether it's discovery, development, or also delivery. Um, as a registered nurse, I work in an emergency department and also at a diabetes and endocrine center, and I see the horrific things that come in through the emergency department as a result of people not having access to what they need. But I also see in our diabetes and endocrine center um, how when people do have access to care that they can afford and that they can understand, because we have to make sure that as we move forward with technology, which is incredibly exciting, that we're making sure that it's culturally competent and also culturally diverse, so that we're meeting the needs of all people. But by being able to use technology such as continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps and devices where those can be brought into an office and downloaded so that the physician can print out those reports and look at it with the patient for them to be able to better understand what their blood sugars have been looking like 
is huge. So we're very, very excited to be here. We're very, very hopeful that as, um, as everybody moves forward with this, that another piece that is really looked at is we know we rely a lot on the federal government for um, the discretionary funding at NIH's um, National Institutes of Diabetes, Digestion, and Kidney, and also CDC's Division of Diabetes Translation. And we also know that those funds are significantly below where they really need to be. And we really need to, in order to move anything forward in terms of research and discovery, really need the federal government's help with, um, with bumping up those dollars. So very excited to be here, um, and thank you for the opportunity. IBM. Thank you, Chairman Upton. My microphone. Get it, turn that green light. How's that? There we go. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Congresswoman Deget, for the opportunity to speak here. I, I think first, the notion of what we're doing here is one great step in that process, having an open dialogue where we're sharing what we're experiencing. Um, we are going through a tremendous period of change in this industry and with technology. Um, one thing that we actually did in, uh, recently that is similar to what we're doing here, we hosted an innovation event here in D.C. And we invited um, participants from the public sector and commercial sector. The focus was on innovation. And we really didn't bound the discussion in any way, like you're, like you're doing today. We gave them the opportunity, tell us what you're doing to innovate in your enterprise, and tell us what kind of impact it's having. And some very interesting themes that came out of that um, was just exhibited through the discussion that rallied through the course of the conversation. And it was, it was the voice of practitioners. So giving the voice to the practitioners, people who are trying to do their job and leverage information technology was, was a big part of that. They all aligned around this notion that it, it had to occur in terms of better quality, experience, and safety for the people that they were serving. Um, but they're also having to do so in a constrained cost environment. So they are having to do so and make investments, drive innovation with that balance of improving the value, or the benefit, but also managing to the costs. And they spoke about real impact in, in different ways that either they're tapping into uh, natural language processing to get more complete, accurate information to see individuals and populations. We talked about, they, they spoke about using streaming data and analytics in order to have information in a real-time context and do simulation that allowed them to be modeling and have insights that they might not otherwise have. We talked about opportunities around cognitive computing and the impact that it can have in helping uh, clinicians make better decisions in the process of the care that they're providing. And, and that gave, I think, a lot of encouragement to the discussion of can we receive ROI, return on investment, for the, the investment we're making into information technology and supporting this industry. And I thought we got a lot of great support for that very issue through the stories that those folks shared. We see, um, as we look, look forward, several topic areas where there's tremendous opportunity to continue to unlock value. The areas of evidence-based personalized medicine with the declining cost of processing the genome, um, incredible opportunities there for innovation and greater knowledge and, and how that can in provide input to the care that we pr uh, provide. Interoperability, sharing information in a way that gives us completeness of data about individuals is also an important part of, of the equation of, of addressing the opportunity in one that we're focused on. And then finally, analytics that support both effective clinician engagement and also or clinician support in the work that they're doing, but also interacting with patients. Um, that is a, another area where we see tremendous opportunity. And so in terms of what can we do better and what, what kind of help um, do we think makes a difference, the consistency and clarity with which regulation and guidance is provided is, is very significant to us. We compete like anybody else in terms of where to provide our investment or where to deploy our investment dollars. In, an, in a company that plays in many industries, we see a lot of opportunity to apply the kinds of approaches that we've, we've, we've put to use in effective ways in banking and automotive and other industries. We'd like to promote the use in, in IT, I mean in healthcare, but consistency of guideline makes a difference. The other thing that's important is the continued focus on investment in innovation 
that can make a difference. We have, we have a, an NIH-funded grant we're doing right today, uh, collaborating with Geisinger and Sutter that's helped using our predictive modeling capabilities together with natural language processing to help earlier diagnose people who are at high risk of a condition with enough accuracy and time to be able to take action and address that. So more support on those areas are part of what I think can help us continue to accelerate the good work that we've been doing with our clients in the market today. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Harris, hope, hope everything's okay. Hey, I'm just a fender bender. <laughs> All right. So thank you for... Uh, there. Is that better? Okay, great. Thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation because I really think fundamentally it's about caring for patients, and that's what we need to do with this technology, and that's what I'd like to speak about today. So I think as you've heard, medicine has been on the long road to transition, but we are in a really uh, formative position right now to really fundamentally change the way we deliver care. Now, 10,000 Americans will reach the age of 65 every day for the next 15 to 20 years. They will carry the incidence of disease that we all know about, cancer, heart disease, um, uh, musculoskeletal disease. And if we simply try and care for them exactly the way we've been doing for the last 100 years, we will not have the capacity to do it, nor will we have the dollars to do it. So our fundamental opportunity now is the opportunity to use this technology to redesign how we deliver care. So let me just talk about two of those opportunities. The first one is to fundamentally think about where we deliver that care and who's delivering the care. With this technology, we can suddenly redefine the care delivery site closer to the home, where patients fundamentally would prefer to receive that care, whereas in fact it is safer, and in the long run it will be cheaper if we can deliver it that way. Um, so today, we have at the Cleveland Clinic, we will see 1.3 million patients who walk through the physical doors of the Cleveland Clinic. But through the power of technology, we can imagine a day when less than half of those individuals actually have to come through a physical door. That through this idea of interoperability, we will be able to garner the information we need through these devices that you've heard about, to put that in front of the individuals who are practicing at the top of their license. So we will need to empower all of our allied health professionals, as well as our nurses, as well as our physicians, but give them the tools to be able to think differently about these patients and to deliver that care um, where the patients prefer to receive it. So I think redesigning the site of care is an important opportunity for us through the use of this technology. The second one for me is really starting to think about not every individual patient, but how we can use the information that we now have to think about hundreds of thousands of patients with particular disorders and to start thinking about seeking out patients who actually need to care rather than waiting until they have an illness or a symptom that brings them into our facilities. Uh, again, I think this allows us, through the power of information, to know when a patient actually needs care and to pursue them for that care. It will be, in the long run, far more cost effective if we can get to that model. Now, to make that happen, we will have to empower our patients as well and give them the tools that they need. Not only can we use the power of computing to um, enhance the skill set of our professionals, but we can use the power of that computing to enhance the decision making of our patients, make them far more knowledgeable, and actively engage them in their own health care and health care decision making. So we can level the playing field with this technology and make better decisions all the way around. And then last, if we take all of this information and focus it on the areas that we do not understand, I think we have an opportunity to revolutionize what I call new knowledge generation. So focused development of new molecules, new pharmaceuticals, 
targeted at problems that we really understand because we've aggregated the information and we've used it to change our basic new knowledge development cycle. So today what we do is we think about, we find a molecule, uh, we see that it has some activity in a petri dish, we imagine a study that we might conduct, and then we start up a clinical trial not fully understanding what that population looks like in whole and whether or not we'll actually be able to recruit a population large enough to make a determination. We can turn that on its head today. At the Cleveland Clinic, we do this uh, in um, partnership with lots of scientists where instead of doing the study in reverse, we aggregate the data first, we simulate the trial, uh, we put in the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and we can have an, a very clear understanding of whether or not that clinical trial can actually be conducted and whether we can get enough patients to draw a scientific conclusion. So I would just end by saying that we're going to talk a lot about technology today, uh, but it really is about fundamentally redesigning the care that we can deliver to every American. Thank you. Not knowing what your remarks were before, that's a perfect segue to, to Anne with 23 and Me. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for inviting me here. Um, and I have to say, I am, I'm unbelievably excited that this issue is actually coming to head and that we're really talking about the technology in healthcare. Um, so there's a little bit of background about me. I was on, I was on Wall Street for 10 years investing in healthcare companies. And, um, and while it was a wonderful experience, part of my takeaway from that was really that, that it wasn't the system that I actually wanted. That I was investing in companies that were all focused on, on the treatment, which is something that we clearly need. But, but if I had my dream world, I want to be healthy at 100 and, and not need any of these treatments. I never want to see a hospital bed. I never want to take any medications. I want to be healthy. And, and who's focused on that? And, um, and so I started realizing after this 10 years of investing that, that no one was really representing me. And, and more and more as I'd, I'd look at sort of the whole healthcare system and I would see, you know, there's the doctors and doctors are focused really on mostly on treatment. There's some prevention, but mostly treatment and that the insurance companies are all kind of, you know, looking at what's the best sort of big picture cost effective treatment for me and they're making decisions for me. And when I'm in research, I'm considered a human subject. And, and so where's my voice? And, and I had all these experiences where I had all these doctors and insurance companies and hospital systems talking, and they talk about the individual and the patients, and, and, but the patient didn't really have a voice. And I started to realize, like, but I, I want a voice at the table. It's my health care, and it's me. And, and I might not want what is necessarily best for the whole system, but I want what I want, and I want to have some choice in this. And so, so 23andMe was really born out of sort of this idea that I want to give consumers actually have voice at the table in both research and in their own health care. And we're at a society right now where or we're at a, a, a point with the technology where you look at something like YouTube and how people suddenly have a voice in media. And I remember, you know, days long ago when media companies were saying, I'll never put my content online. And suddenly how much that has changed. And a lot of that changed because the consumer suddenly had a voice. And you look at the popularity of things like Susan G. Komen and Live Strong, and people are clearly interested in participating. If I asked, if I came to you and I said I had some incurable thing and I asked people to raise their hands about how many of you would take a survey to help me make a discovery, I bet 95% of you in this room would say yes, you would do that. But we're not capturing that enthusiasm. And, and overwhelming, it's actually interesting sitting next to Dr. Drucker, is that I actually have one of my parents' best friends is actually a Gleevec, she was on the Gleevec clinical trial, and she's still alive, and she's still responding. And she said, she's like, I'm actually one of the oldest surviving individuals responding to Gleevec, and I think someone should study me, and no one wants to study me. I can't get someone. And, and so it's really hard to actually participate in research. It's hard for an individual to suddenly show up at a medical center and say, hey, I'm really interesting. I want you to do something. So, 
So 23andMe was sort of born with the ideas, how do I give the consumer a voice, again, in both sort of their own health care as well as in research. So what we do is we enable individuals to get access to their genetic information and to learn about themselves with this idea is that can you actually become, by engaging individuals, can you actually become more involved in, your, in prevention? And what we're finding, there was just a nature study that came out saying that what 23andMe is doing is it's driving people to come to their doctors and it's creating sort of this teaching moment where people suddenly want to engage in conversations about what can I do. And diabetes is actually a great example where there's actually a federally funded program, the Diabetes Prevention Program, what was shown to be remarkably successful at preventing type 2 diabetes. And, and we fund it today at about $7 million a year versus all of the billions of dollars that's going into treatment. But, but here was a program that actually showed really clearly that consumers actually could be engaged to potentially reduce their risk. And, and isn't that actually what the consumers want? So, so I would say, yeah, so how do we actually make that more and more something that consumers can actually be part of? So again, one of the things that 23andMe does, we engage people with their genetic information because we find it's something that people were really interested in. They're interested in their ancestry. They're interested in, in finding relatives, and they're interested in you know, all the fun things, you know, you know asparagus and, and whether cilantro. Cilantro is remarkably controversial on our website if you love it or if you hate it. So, but it's the fun aspects, and part of the thing with healthcare is like, who wants to engage with their, you no hemoglobin count like that's not fun like we kind of try to make it fun so like engage people with 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 the genetic and the fun aspects of it but then we also ask people surveys. So we ask them to take things, um, you know, we have a uh, survey about uh, commonly used medications. So for instance, you know, there's probably some percentage of people in this room who take Benadryl and they fall asleep and some percentage of people take Benadryl and they get hyper. So is there a genetic component of that? And if you're giving Benadryl for the first time to your child and it's 9 o'clock at night, you might want to know which way is that going to go because I have small children and that can be challenging. So, so how do we actually you know, get all this information from consumers? So we ask consumers um, to fill out surveys for us. And we find overwhelmingly 80% of our customers are all taking our surveys. So they come in, they immediately take a survey, and get, we're collecting millions. So we have 180 million phenotypic data points from our customers now. And what this has enabled is essentially this real-time research model. So again, it's one of my takeaways from Wall Street is you realize there's all these fiefdoms of research. So, you know, like Cleveland Clinic and Harvard, and Evans, they all do their research and they try to collaborate, but it's kind of hard because that's how they get grants and that's how they get funding. It's just hard. But consumers can just that. And the way we can disrupt that is by sharing all of our information. So how do I get millions and millions of people all with their genetic information, all with their medical records, all with like their, you know, the ongoing information about, you know, from smartphone apps, et cetera, like how much they're sleeping, what are they doing every day? How do I combine all of that information and then have real-time research? And what we're starting to find is that pharma companies and other academics, we have 35 academic partnerships underway, they come to us and they say, I have a question. I want to know if this genetic variant is associated with pancreatic cancer. And in 24 hours, I can actually get them an answer. And instead of actually having to do, for instance, there was a big New England Journal study that came out talking about a, a, a genetic marker called GBA and Parkinson's disease. There was tons and tons of names on the paper, which means it was probably very expensive to fund. And um, in 23andMe, we looked at it and we said, oh, I wonder if we could replicate that. And in 24 hours, we saw we could actually see that same association. So suddenly, research becomes about a data query. How can I actually just run a query and say, is this genetic association you know, correlated with, with this disease, with this phenotype? And my goal here is not, is to really empower all of the researchers around the world, all the people who are doing great work and the great research. How can I actually help them do their job better and not make it about data collection and not make it about who has access to the best samples, but say, who's doing the best analysis? And so you run the analysis and make it really cheap. And how can we actually get it where that one scientist doesn't have a hypothesis every couple of years, but they have a hypothesis every month? And they want to test it all the time. And consumers, the, the big takeaway I've had from all this is that consumers want to be engaged. They want you to ask them questions. The number one thing that our consumers are asking me, they're like, ask me more questions. If they have an incurable disease, Ask me more. I want to do more because like, this is their chance. And we're not successfully engaging them enough. So I'm super excited to be here because I really think that this is an opportunity. For the first time, technology and healthcare are coming together. And consumers want to be part of it. And you can see how it's disrupted media. You can see how it's disrupted the rest of the world. And it is going to disrupt healthcare. Wow. 
<laughs> Good work. Thanks. That's why you're here. Dr. Blatt. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Upton. I'm honored to be here. <clears throat> Um, by training, I'm a family doctor. I, I practiced in a small town in uh, Connecticut uh, for almost 15 years. Um, I had an interesting experience probably about 20 years ago where I was on call for about a dozen family doctors on a three-day holiday weekend. If any of you are doctors, you know that's not going to be a good weekend for me. Um, uh, Saturday morning, um, uh, Friday night, you're, if you're a mom, your kids get sick. If you're nice, you wait till Saturday morning before you call me. Saturday morning, the phone went off. It was the 90s. I didn't have EMRs. I didn't have a lot of what I have available to me today. I sat with a headset on and got phone calls. I would say over the next six hours, I might have gotten 150 phone calls. Couldn't send them all to the hospital. It's a three-day holiday weekend. How to do it was logical and reasonable. Asked a bunch of questions. At the end of the six hours, I observed that I probably had taken care of, treated 75% of the people on the phone. Um, 25% needed some follow-on care, a test. That was going to be the rest of my weekend. Um, when, I, when I thought about what I had done, I said, well, okay. Um, I had treated people in place extremely conveniently. Um, maybe a negative for me, it was free. I didn't get paid for any of it. Um, and I wasn't quite sure about the legality. It was, it, it was a little fuzzy at this point. So aside from being illegal and possibly free, um, it was a good idea. <laughs> Um, I try to convince my colleagues that, you know, hey, I've discovered a new way to can treat massive amounts of people for extremely low cost. And eh, not a whole lot of interest. I changed my direction and came to Intel. Fast forward 20 years. We now have electronic medical records. You set the conditions in the United States which are necessary but not sufficient to enable care to move into cyberspace to dramatically lower the price point and the cost delivery points of care, to increase convenience and increase patient experience. The triple aim that you've often talked about is actually within our reach, enabled by electronic records as a foundational technology. Now I add genomics, and I add information about the personalized medicine and the personalized treatment aspects of the patient. I add Internet of Things, the technology, the sensors that are going to start to come about, and the patient-generated data that's going to come off those sensors. Whoa, it's like my Saturday morning, but you're cheating. You're giving me data. I'm not just having to ask blind questions. I've got electronic records. I've got physiologic data. I've got personalized information. And now I'm going to add cloud-based clinical decision support to help make me smarter, as Dr. Harris said, to help me practice at the top of my license, to make me more intelligent, the information, the natural language processing that's coming about. This is a real new world of care. Care that moves into this new environment, using all these tools and this vision that we see coming together, it's going to disrupt the status quo dramatically. It's going to change how we do things. And you're going to see a lot of, um, in technology we call it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And maybe the signal that this is actually starting to come about is when the FUD rises about the changes that are coming that you know it's finally real. And I'm finally seeing mainstream healthcare pay attention to the idea that I can deliver care in cyberspace using all of these tools that you've now made available to me at a much more cost-effective point. Think of my Saturday morning. How does a family doctor in six hours treat 150 patients? I didn't go to the six-second visit. I fundamentally changed the paradigm in how I treated people. And now you're going to enable that with many more tools going forward. I think the critical thing here is to create the business environment that allows this risk to occur. I took a risk when I did a lot of this back in the, in the 90s. Some of my partners thought I was a little crazy trying to treat people on the phone. They wouldn't have done it. They would have said, come in, go to the emergency room. That would have been their response. I was looking out as a family doc for what I thought was in the best interest of my patients. Allow risk to creep into this environment. Create a point of view as Congress. If you think this vision we just all painted here has value, stand up and say it. Promote it to the, to the, to the citizens. Most citizens don't know what we just said is even possible. Most of the medical community doesn't know what this is possible. As Congress, have a point of view. Promote it to people if you believe this is where you want to go. Enable experiments to happen. Right now you have CMMI looking at many different ways to change the payment system. What about cyber care? Create an experiment with Medicare that allows citizens to choose. Go back to citizen choice. 
Anna has already told you that citizens will opt in to experimental ideas, to clinical trials. Let them choose. Put the power back in their hands. Allow a citizen who might want to take a cyber care Medicaid benefit, Medicare benefit, allow that system to thrive. Let it compete with face-to-face -face care in an open market. And let's see which wins. Both things will coexist. One's not going away versus the other. But let's create an opportunity for this to thrive. Let's let patients see their data. Right now, even though you have laws like HIPAA, it's really hard to get a hold of your data. Let's put things in place. If you want interoperability to occur, you have to create a business climate. We can learn from countries that tried top-down approaches to enforce interoperability. It didn't work. They spent billions doing it. We can also learn from industries that allowed business conditions to be created that fostered the need for interoperability. Create those business conditions that foster the need for interoperability. Maybe simply saying that the patients have a right to view their data in close to real time, to see their genetic data, to see the doctor's notes, to see the imaging data. That might foster the interoperability you're looking for. It certainly would promote the cyber care that I'm talking about. I think we're at a cusp. You have the ability here to allow a small amount of risk to creep into the environment, to foster innovation and new care delivery models using the tools and technologies that you hear around the table are becoming available. Let that happen. Let that new model thrive. Great. Jonathan Bush. Sorry, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know if this ends well. Thank you very much. I'm in awe of what you guys have to take on, the scope, the swath uh, of responsibility that you have. Uh, no matter how many 22-year-olds you guys get working for you, it just seems like a huge amount <laughs> to keep track of, especially given the complexity of stuff like, like healthcare. I guess I'll focus my comments on uh, that which isn't in the room, because uh, what will, if it's allowed by what's in this room uh, to happen, that which will make healthcare better, uh, are the things that are not in this room. The entrepreneurs who are not innovating in healthcare today, the patients who are not participating in healthcare today because they don't think it's for them. It's some sort of weird Oldsmobile with fins on the back that we don't relate to. Hey, we do like old. We like them, I know. God bless them. <laughs> but you own them now, I guess, so uh, we're all supposed to like them. Um, so uh, what I would sort of draw your attention to is that I, I got a long list of, sp uh, of these non-participants, the not yet, yet what, $2.2 billion, all the venture capital combined going into any disruptive technology in healthcare last year? Two point, that's valet tips at the you know, Rayburn building, that's nothing, right? The High Tech Act was $30 billion giving money to doctors to buy technology. So basically all of it was you know, built when Flock of Seagulls were on the charts. I mean, this is old, old stuff and no one's going in to build new stuff, relatively speaking, no one. And went in and almost got crushed, frankly, in a wanton way that scared everyone, made me ill watching 23andMe from a distance. I had entrepreneurs that were actually working on a business plan, Stephanie right there. And when she watched it, got crushed, said, screw it, I'm gonna stay safe and stay at Athena, right? There goes, how many jobs do new ventures create that mature companies, compared to mature companies per job? You got 62 million patients that we know about. We have 52 million patients, uh, 56 million patients in AthenaNet across all our customers, 52,000 doctors doing their scut work, their billing and their coding and their medical records. We've, we've uh, we got 85% of the Medicare lives refusing, just not doing their fully paid Medicare wellness visit. Just not that into it, thanks very much. They're conscientious objectors in the current system. So you have patients non-participating and you have entrepreneurs non-participating. And I will say there's two fundamental reasons why. One is the things that make it work are surprisingly illegal. With the best of intentions, you guys have made things that work in every other industry illegal. When you walk up to a bank machine, you can be drunk and in the wrong country and still get your money out and have your bank balance reconciled. And you're like, oh, $3, you know. But it was a miracle, it was worth $3. Right? And what happened was the bank that had the information went to the bank that needed the trade and said, 
I'll give you this patient's information, whatever you need, what I just got off the card, and you give me $3. And then the bank will either charge you, or they'll, if you have a high balance, maybe they'll eat it, right? If that happened between a doctor and a hospital in the U.S. today, it would be anti-kickback. It's, it's a prison crime for, for that type of supply chain par partnership. Stockbroker works with a mortgage, a mortgage underwriter, works with a mortgage originator. A stockbroker works with um, a, a custody agent. There are kickbacks going on all throughout healthcare, uh, throughout society, except in healthcare, where all the systems are interoperable, which means a federal committee came up with some definition of the little dits and dots that you're supposed to have to pass the test. By the way, all remotes are interoperable today, according to the F F That's why all of you only have one remote in front of your TV. If you spent six hours with your remote, you could get your Sanyo to work with your Mitsubishi because it's required to be interoperable. Similarly, you have all these interoperable EMRs and nobody is interoperating because the business incentive, the ability to say, well, actually, I don't care about those federal things that are in the continuum of care document. What I need to know is if she's claustrophobic because I need to know whether I'm going to give her the open donut magnet or the closed donut magnet when she comes in for her x-ray or her MRI. That's not part of the message. And I can't pay somebody or at least reimburse them the extra effort to, uh, to, to make that exchange. It's, the, and it's not a one side of the aisle thing or another. It started with the Bush administration who created a loophole which said hospitals are allowed to buy doctors their EMRs for them, pay 85%. When they're thinking EMR, it's a noun. It's a thing that you buy with a box and you like boot it up, which is so not a word in my generation. But anyway, so all these hospitals go out and trying to get the doctors to take on the EMR. Then the next administration comes in and says, we're gonna, we're gonna do you one better. We're gonna give you $30 billion to buy these things that you've already looked at three times. The hospital offered you them for free and you still didn't buy them. And then we're gonna cut your pay if you don't buy these pieces of crap that don't talk to each other, right? And now everybody's gone and done it, and they still don't talk to each other, so now the government's taking away all the penalties and just giving out the bonuses anyway. This is actually happening. It's like an Orwell novel. It's real. So if you took away some of those obvious blocks to business exchange, to supply chain partnership that happened in other industries, and regulate it and be careful, et cetera, I think you'd get um, a lot of movement. I think you'd get a lot more movement. Lots and lots of entrepreneurs. You know, the church isn't what it was when we were kids. The, the army's too hard to join. It's too specialized. Even protesting appears to be specialized. We're looking for something important to do with all of our nurturing that we've gotten. And going in and building businesses in healthcare is really appealing. Right? But first of all, the obvious business models that would work in every other industry are structurally illegal, which could be fixed. And then the second thing, which is really hard to fix, is there a is there is a culture of wanton, random regulation and deregulation that is so scary and so upsetting, it is soul crushing. So what happened at 23andMe? I'll give you an example from our company. We put 200,000 hours of the best and brightest people we've got to make sure that every single one of our 52,000 doctors would be ready to be ICD-10 compliant. ICD-10 is the new diagnosis codes that we were told absolutely categorically every doctor had to use no exceptions on whatever it was, April 1st or something like that, 2014. Tavener got up at the big IT convention in February, absolutely no excuse. And on April Fool's Day, we got a letter, nope, just kidding, maybe next year. And these, so fine, 200,000, 30 million bucks, whatever it costs me, I don't know, to do that. And I'm public and it's growing. We're making money. So we're annoyed. But those kids who just poured pizza parties all night, weekends, and then just randomly pulling it, same thing happened. We got permission from the national coordinator to let doctors receiving information pay some of the EMR cost of the doctor who had the information. Said it was okay. Spent three years repricing our medical records service so that it was paid for by the order so that there was a per order charge for the receiver. To, and at the last, no, not at the last minute, a year after they said we could do it, after we switched all our pricing to all of our customers, they said, no, you can't. And again, we're big, we're public, we can afford it, we can laugh about it. I can even show up at one of these things and rant about it, which is I'm already feeling better. But, uh, yeah, bless you. <laughs> but, wow, if, it, 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 what I'm thinking about is all the entrepreneurs who aren't going to go do it, all the patients who aren't going to play. And we're going to pay for them anyway, but they're just not going to get their pap smear because 35% of the time the result's going to be lost. So why bother, right? 
That's the thing you guys got to be aware of. We, these are great institutions, right? I mean, I, everybody knows IBM. Everybody trusts them. Cleveland Clinic, I mean, these are great places. But they are, and all the big cancer centers, but they are, they are a, you know, the Diabetes Association, these are a very, very, very small part of the potential energy interested in healthcare. They are the elites that we already know and trust, and they're great, and there's nothing wrong with them. But it is the disruptors that you guys need to allow in. Just allow them in. Don't fund them. Don't have CMMI sort of bless them. Just allow them. That, that's probably too much already, so I'll stop right there. This is why we're listening. Okay. I'm done now. I can breathe. Paul. How do I follow that? Uh, the passion's worn off. Worn off uh, by the way, batting for the entrepreneurs here. So, um, Go, uh, thank you. So, uh, uh, eight years ago, I was celebrating something, which was recovering from uh, quad bypass surgery at the age of 44. Uh, they say food or family. Mine was family. My blockage was identical to my father. My father's identical twin brother died at my age, 44 at the time, uh, from a massive heart attack. I was diagnosed with a 20th century technology, so a heart scanner, three minutes. That's all it took. It was about as simple as it could be. A big, big, uh, absolutely in favor of non-invasive medicine. I don't want my son, I have a 10-year-old, to have the same outcome I had, which is to have to suffer that surgery uh, and its consequences and, and recovery. Um, I believe fundamentally that the data about my phenotype and about my genotype is what's going to help him not have to undergo that. Except that data I can't get into a research project today easily. I routinely sign a, my academic medical center by paperwork every year, but uh, I'd like to find more ways to make that available uh, to, to everyone. Importantly, um, it's not about just individuals. I think we need to very much respect the, the scale and nature of opportunity that we have as we have this discussion. So think about uh, 400,000 uh, preventable adverse events, lives affected by, uh, you know, extraordinarily bad things happening to them in a healthcare system. Um, think about how much time and effort we spend in the automobile industry, you know, current topic, uh, worrying about tens of lives or hundreds of lives when we've got 400,000 preventable adverse events that we don't actively talk about in healthcare. Think about the 500 billion to one trillion dollars that nominally is considered waste in our healthcare system today. That is a thousand one billion dollar market segments for an entrepreneur. There are people out there, to Jonathan's point, that want to go tackle that problem, take the cost out of the healthcare system. And the cost is probably going to be a 5% or 10% uh, of the invested capital to, to, to recover that trillion dollars of savings. So an extraordinary uh, rate of return. Think about the you know, often quoted 17 years it takes for, for evidence to turn into practice today. Um, I've never seen an industry move as slowly, so I've had the good fortune of building companies or being part of building companies in four different industries all around information infrastructure and had the opportunity. My last company was a big data and analytics leader in the communication industry. And so we got to see what mobile technology could do to the world uh, and what it could do to people's lives. Um, nothing took 17 years. Our ability to create pace in healthcare is, is clear. Those 400,000 lives and trillion dollars of savings and waste uh, potential, uh, the 17 years, think about the, the opportunity for innovation and our in ability to enable innovation, uh, to embrace it, uh, to, uh, to support it through uh, what is a, uh, a healthcare system that's generally not been accepting, uh, is extraordinary. We've got to accelerate pace and we've got to find a way to take this kind of capability that we're talking about today, uh, the regulatory framework, standards frameworks, to unlock that innovation. We've got to apply it. And I agree with Jonathan. Tremendous number of entrepreneurs that, that want to move out of uh, the financial industry, who want to move out of other industries and bring their knowledge and skills to, to this one. So I'd like us to, to think about moving beyond data, because there's a lot of discussion here about unlocking the, the, the data. We've just got to do that in a sensible way. I don't think it's regulated. In many other industries, the quality of the data is, is, you know, is tied to the, where you source it from. And so you come to know what's good data and bad data, and you want to procure it um, uh, commercially from the places that provide high quality data. I don't think you have to necessarily regulate the data. But let's get beyond the data. The interoperability, I think we've well covered here. Um, I really believe the 21st century health uh, care is application of the data, though, in a computable context. So really, the 21st century, if, if I could summarize, it's about computable health. It's about our application of that to, to solving problems. And uh, we've spoken about a number of those today. 
I'm not sure, if we talk about national assets here in the United States, we probably have the, oh, no, we don't probably, we do have the largest inventory of evidence-based protocols, pathways, algorithms, measures, assessments that exist. It's a national treasure. Almost none of it is computable. No, almost none of it is applied at the point of care today. Almost none. So our ability to take all of those NIH uh, research dollars that we spend money on, producing great evidence-based research, and then not applying it practice, we've got to find a way to enable that to take place at the point of care um, throughout the healthcare system. So a couple of paradigm shifts uh, that I'll draw on and resonate with Dr. Harris's comments. Um, you know, today we traditionally think about evidence-based practice, the, that long process of creating evidence, turning it into practice. I think the future is going to hold practice-based evidence. It's the other way around. It's taking the data that we produce from the outcome of uh, these healthcare processes and turning it back into new discovery, uh, new development. I thought the moniker, by the way, for the session, it got it right. The error is all the way around. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the second paradigm is, uh, I think, shift is this idea from moving from treating one person at a time to treating all people at once. That's a radically different way to think uh, about the future. And, uh, uh, the technology that we're talking about uh, is going to do that. And then moving from the hospital, obviously, to the home. So what I'd ask us to do is, is think about as citizens and as um, uh, in the roles uh, that we play about what our moonshot is, in effect, for the application of digital health to our healthcare system. How much cost do we want to take out? What is our national objective? What is our national objective at reducing uh, the impact on people's lives from pre uh, preventable adverse events? We should have zero preventable adverse events, not, uh, uh, not sustain uh, and uh, support the, uh, the number that we have today. So uh, setting some national objectives and then a framework within which uh, we can uh, deliver improvements on those things, I think, uh, uh, is, uh, is where we ought to spend a lot of time. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, contribute to the discussion. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you all. It was, a, it was a great presentation uh, by all of you, and I, want to, I really do want to get into uh, a discussion stage, much shorter responses, um, and really some specifics. And uh, for the, I know that we've had folks come and go, members particularly. I know if, if you want to participate, uh, Brett and John, move up to the table. We've got a couple of empty chairs, and we'll put a little thing in front of you so we know who you are. Uh, not that we don't already. Uh, but, uh, you know, how, how, do we, how do we take some of these roadblocks away? How, how do we make this system work? Because, you know, our goal is that, you know, it, we're not seeing legislation this year. It's just, it's just too fast. So we're going to have a lot of these discussions. We're hoping by the end of the calendar year we'll be ready with, with something that will then move next year. Uh, that, that's, that's the goal. So. What are some specifics of what we have to do to change the landscape to accomplish uh, many of the ideas that, that you talked about? And we'll just, you know, start with uh, Frank Pallone. This is the first hand that I see. Oh. Um, well, I, I wanted to ask, is it Wozicki? Wozicki. I, sh I should know because I have a large Anne. Slav. Anne I have a large friend. Slava community in my district. Anne totally works. Anne, okay. <laughs> I want to ask you a question, but I, but it, it's it's sort of ironic, I guess, that I was going to ask you about sort of a business model, and then Mr. Bush started in with the whole business model, which I'm not asking you anything, but I do say that. <laughs> I, but I would say I don't necessarily. I know you're just raising the issue. You're not. You're challenging us. But I, you know, I have to point out that you know when I, when I was listening to you, I was saying you know the problem, of course, with with the healthcare is that, in my opinion, you can't just use the business model. And I'm not suggesting that you're saying you can all the time. But you know, it's just that, uh, particularly uh, for us as as uh, you know representing constituents, you know, they see healthcare differently. They don't necessarily see it as you know, whether somebody's going to make money or whether or not things can be more efficient using money. Because they, you know, they think they still have this idea, which hopefully is true, that people in healthcare, you know, are doing it because they love it, because they uh, uh, care, because they, uh, you know, and that somehow we have a responsibility because it's healthcare in people's lives and, and, uh, uh, and their health. Uh, that it's, it's, it's viewed a little differently. But it's sort of ironic because I'm going to issue about the business model. You know, I noticed in the... Um, in uh, this uh, statement about your background, it says that individuals um, 
it says you provide rapid genetic testing and interpretation to individuals for only $99, okay? So I just wanted to ask, how does that come into play? I mean, has this been successful? To what extent is the cost issue, which is obviously true for everything we've talked about here, mm -hmm. it's always going to be an issue of cost and whether there's enough money to pay for things. How does that play into what you do, the, you know, the fact that you have this $99 cost? What, how is the cost uh, factor uh, yeah. figure into it all? Because it does kind of relate back to what he said about the business model. Yeah, so it's um, the cost issue is, is, is actually very core to what we have done, where we're unusual in the sense we've intentionally not gone after reimbursement. So one of the things that I do think is incredibly important for healthcare going forward is the direct access nature. So for an individual to come and say, I want something and to be able to get it. Because if I went through reimbursement and I had a physician or I had you know, genetic counselors, like, it would add significant cost to the test. So one of the things 23andMe has tried to do is, unlike the traditional healthcare model where it's a $3,000 genetic test and it's low volume, high margin, we've done the opposite. I'm looking for a low margin test that's high volume. So I would like to enable, you know, millions and millions of people to get access to this. I'd like to democratize healthcare. And so we have done that. We have 700,000 customers who have done 23andMe, and we've been around for eight years. If I look at some of the other genetic testing companies that are out there, and they've been out for, you know, decades, they have comparable numbers, but it's been decades. So we've really, you know, and we had, in the last year, we set out an initiative to get a million people in a year. And, um, and that's when we had started a marketing program. We started more aggressively trying to really just enable the broad access for it. And, and that's, that's when we saw significant growth. And we really saw that people are interested in the direct access and they like this. But it's, it's been core to us. And I do believe that healthcare should be able to be affordable. And I think one of the really interesting trends that's coming is you see, you know, these minute clinics and you see Walmart and you see other groups suddenly starting to have low cost Healthcare. If I have, you know, if I want to just see if my son has an ear infection, do I have to do the whole hassle? I could just go into Walmart and have his ear checked. And so, in part, one of the things I think is an interesting trend also for healthcare is that because we're so focused on prevention, and you do think about the economics, like who makes money off prevention? Like it's some of the things that like I rest, I, like that's what keeps me up at night. Like if I never get sick, I don't generate money for this healthcare system. So, so who makes money off me? And what I find fascinating is when Walmart announced that they're going to have physicians in all of their stores in the next six to seven years, that becomes the core for me of prevention. I walk in and they say, hey, Ann, you're high risk for type 2 diabetes, aisle 7, workout DVDs, exercise shoes, let's work on your diet plan. Because most Americans are walking into Walmart to get these things, or you're walking to Target, or you're walking into your retail store. So how does that actually become? And a low-cost solution that's going to enable your lifestyle to actually help you modify it is, is I think, actually where you're really going to start to see that change. Thank you. Dr. Burgess. I'm taking huh? names, by the way. We've got a little less there, so I got Thank Dr. Burgess, Los Caps, Joe Pitts. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And, and let's stay on 23andMe for a moment. I am a, I am a customer. Um, in another life, I practice medicine. And I just got to tell you, I mean, you develop your problem list, you develop your history, you know what hospitalizations, what surgery. So that's always right in front of you when you're seeing a patient. But what a different world it would be if you knew what was possibly just over the horizon for that patient. I really have no interest in Walmart knowing about my risk for type 2 diabetes because then they might lock me out of the chip aisle. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's a risk. There's a downside. But, um, you know, I just look at, at, at my own risk, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, esophageal carcinoma. I want my doctor to know these things. I don't want it to be a secret and be hidden from them. If I relate something that may be significant for one of these potential future problems, I want them to be able to key in on it or recommend the appropriate diagnostic tests at the appropriate time. So I, I welcome what you do. I, I will confess I bought before you reduced the price, but even at $299, it was worth the, it was worth the cost. And I agree with Mr. Bush. It's a, you know, I, I watched in horror as what happened. I, I thought this was, this is the kind of breakthrough that this country wants to see. And right now we've put it on a back burner. I just hope we haven't taken all of the life out of that project uh, with, uh, on the regulatory side. Yeah, so, so I think that, um, you know, 
when we started 23andMe, we recognized it was always going to be a challenge um, and that we were doing something and we're doing it in a different way. And frankly, even going back to the pricing question, we've gotten a lot of criticism because people have even come to said and they said, look, healthcare costs go up. They don't go down. What are you doing? And so, so there's been skepticism about what we're doing. And we, we are trying to take a very different approach. And I've always said to people at the company that we, we want to do the right thing. And, and we want to move fast. We want to be innovative. But we're going to make mistakes. And so clearly, you know, things come up. And um, we now have a really great team in place. We're really committed to working on this process. And I think it's very clear that there's going to be innovation. But we, we do have a good working relationship to try to define that path going forward. And I think that that's where, you know, a lot of it has been, it's, it's been difficult for a lot of companies. But I think that we're really committed to saying there should be a clear path going forward for everybody. And we're committed to working on that. And so, and I do commend, I mean, the FDA has really been incredibly responsive for us. So I do commend the organization for saying, when I call them, if we say something on a Friday, we get a call back on Monday morning. So there has really been a commitment to saying, we recognize the importance of this and how are we going to move this forward? Mr. Chairman, could you comment on this? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Oh, well, Dr. Blatt, and, and I <laughs> thank you for your, your discussion. Uh, I remember the day I found there was a code that you could charge for a phone call, and it was not until almost a year later that I learned that it didn't matter because the insurance company wasn't going to reimburse for that code anyway. It was, it was great while it lasted, while I thought I was generating income. But you made the comment about why don't we make people, why, do, why don't we make data available to people? Why don't we allow people to have access to their own data? And Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point out in our SGR reform that this committee originated and passed first and now sits waiting for activity over in the Senate. We created that environment where that data could be collected, that could be presented to the, uh, the head of CMS. Uh, they would have to provide feedback to whoever offered that as a, as a possible practice model. The, the, the groundwork has been laid. It may not be fast enough for anyone around this table, but we have begun to, to, to move that as into the realm of possibility where it really hasn't existed before. And that was done, again, primarily because of work of the Energy and Commerce Committee. So thank you, Chairman. You know, one of the things about sharing data and making data available to uh, patients, um, about uh, two years ago in Annals of Internal Medicine, they reported on an experiment called Open Notes. Um, we're talking about a lot of high-tech technology here. Uh, Open Note simply said, I'm going to take the doctor's note and make it available to the patient and encourage them to view the note um, after a doctor's visit. Um, that might seem anti-intuitive to a lot of doctors. What good could possibly come from this? Uh, they had uh, 100 doctors opt in in three different institutions. Uh, they had 10,000 patients. Half of them opened a note. And... Um, Probably the most interesting serendipitous finding was that there was a 70% improvement in med compliance in the patients that viewed their notes. We're talking about med adherence and, and technologies to improve that. This is a free technology. This is a policy change. This is an encouragement to become involved in your health care. This would make me want to get my genomic pile, want me to get an IoT device to measure steps. And I, and, and I sometimes wondered, what was it? They were silent about it. But if you can imagine, if, you, if, you, if I came home from your office and um, my wife asked me, you know, what the docs say, and, you know, if you said something bad to me, my answer is fine. Okay? <laughs> now the wife goes, well, let me see the note. And all of a sudden in the note, I don't know, you wrote I'm an obese, uh, hypertensive, noncompliant diabetic scheduled for emergency stress test. Now my wife looks at me and says, you're taking your pills. <laughs> it's this involvement of the ecosystem. It's, it's involving social media. It's involving people in your caregiver network and empowering them with the data as well. And open notes is something as simple as a policy change. I know I believe uh, Martin Cleveland Clinic adopted open notes after this. Um, so it is our standard of practice. So we have a million patients now who have signed up for the access to information through the portal. We release the patient, the physician's note, the second they sign it. So it's available to the physician, other physicians, and the patient all at the same time. But the point I was going to make is the point that I think we really need to stay focused on the consumer patient in this model. And 
by engaging them, we will change the practice. So let me just give you a simple example from the Cleveland Clinic. So we started that portal um, model almost a decade ago. And I, I still remember the first week of going live with it. It was covered on local television. And I can tell you I got nothing but telephone calls from patients and consumers saying, what in the world are you doing putting this stuff on the Internet? Now, I can tell you about three years after that, we suddenly had patients calling saying, why can't you release these results faster to us? And now they're saying, I expect to see everything in this portal going forward. So I think consumers have really driven our model, uh, and we are being responsive to them. So as we start to think about what we could do broadly, one of the things that I see is this general regulation of, of HIPAA. And I'm not looking to change it. What I'm looking to do is to empower a patient to choose to opt out of it should they want. And they should have a clear reason for doing that. We have a menu of services, and if you would like this service, you can push this button, opt out of it, and you're taking on that personal responsibility. I think what you will find is you have an activated patient, an engaged patient, and a patient who's helping us redesign the delivery system. Thank you. Uh, oh, go ahead. Thank you. I just. Um, I wanted to tag on to something that Dr. Blatt had said, and um, actually that Dr. Harris just kind of alluded to as well. When we talk about, um, and you were mentioning being able to see, when, when you can read, and I'm, I'm speaking from a patient perspective now, so as somebody with a chronic disease, when I can read what my doctor's report is, or when I can look at my, which I'm embarrassed to show now because it's up higher, because you know stress, whether it's good stress because you're excited to be here or whatever. Well, but, but that's just part of the disease. I mean, it is. Um, you know, just knowing what my numbers are, knowing where my blood sugar is trending, being able to see that as opposed to poking my finger with my glucometer and getting one number that by itself really doesn't mean a whole lot. I know if the number is higher than I want it to be that I feel bad I mean, I feel bad because I feel like it should be in my target range, but it's not for whatever the reason is. But knowing those things, being able to put your eyes on your data, but to also be able to understand what that all means right in the moment, but also for later on, is so empowering and so engaging. But where that becomes a challenge is for people who understand how to use the devices, and they can be very simple. It's still something new that you're getting used to. What about all of the people who aren't actively involved? And I can't remember what the word you used was, but who, who, who aren't participating. They're just there. And why is that? And I think as we move forward, we really need to make sure that we're trying to figure out what do we need to do to get people engaged? Because healthcare has really never been something that we've been active participating Pinson, we've been told you're going to take this much insulin, you're going to check your blood sugar this many times a day, or you know, if you have heart disease, this is what you're going to do, whatever, whatever. But now we're expecting people to step into an area that they haven't been able to step into before to say, I want to do this, or I don't want diabetes, I want to take place in the diabetes prevention program, where is that at, or whatever the case may be. So as we look to engage and empower people, we have to know that they're going to need help getting to the level that they're going to be able to actively engage. And can they do it? Yes. I'm sure everybody will be able to do it at some level, but everybody's not going to be at the same jumping off point. So being able to see your data, being able to read in, in my charts, um, being able to access you know, all of your ancestry data is so incredibly important. But to visualize it as a patient puts it at a whole different level than just hearing your doctor say, Oh, and the other thing, too, is A1Cs, which is your average blood sugar test over three months. We used to go to the office, and we'd have the blood work drawn after our appointment, and then you'd get a phone call, or you'd go to your appointment three or six months later, and they say, hey, by the way, your A1C is, you know, 8%, and, you know, target is 7% or less. Now they do in the office, and the doctor, the, whoever comes in, gives it to the doctor and says, okay, Gina's A1C today is this. Okay, you have a real-time number now, and the doctor and the patient can work on those together. So, thank you. Loss. Thank you, and I don't want to cut you off, Dr. Drucker. Did you want to make a comment? Please go ahead. 
Well, first of all, to uh, my colleagues, I am uh, get, and I don't know if I need this on. Yeah, put it on. Uh, and uh, Fred Upton, even though you're, you may be on your way up, that's okay. You put this together, and I think we're just sort of scra scratching the surface, I think, of a lot of uh, uh, work that, that I hope will get done. And I just want to point out, I've been visualizing a couple of elephants in the room um, that I just want to label very different. One, uh, um, and this gives away my background in public health nursing, there's a lot of folks who don't ever get in this room. And they live and they consume and they uh, usually don't get the health care they need. And they, it may be it's their fault, but there's a lot of barriers there too. So that's one. But the other, uh, there's a bu huge bureaucracy elephant, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I don't know if they... If you've ever tried to access uh, making a change there, I thought I could when I got elected to Congress. Found I was powerless, and um, and and the, the, uh, they do a lot of good work. They happen to be, in my opinion, disease-oriented, not wellness-oriented. I there's nobody, not very many folks, really looking out for wellness and looking at that as something that we want to have as our goal. Um, uh, I just, it harkens me back as this conversation has been going on to when I was a school nurse in, or when I was a student nurse uh, um, a long time ago, the goal was to be able to learn to print because that's the way we transcribed, that's the way we documented. And, and you'd try to read the doctor's illegible, illegible writing um, and how far we've come. But it, we can't be content because there's a long way to go. But I want to make sure that um, in, in this kind of discussion of digital care that we, remember, that we keep in mind of the, the, the population that doesn't know what that means and, and doesn't really have care and that we've got to figure out some way to get them into it. Um, and I hearken to the, the one institution that, that everybody, almost everybody gets to, which is the public school system, so that those kids can, are learning t computer language and access to the digital world. They're also, um, uh, it's my bias about health in the schools, wellness in the schools, uh, school-based clinics, um, and opportunities that we have to broaden uh, how, we, how we do this kind of work. And that some, at some point we want to take the technology that, uh, that you're all so good at and get it to a level where we can empower, uh, maybe not my generation, but the, my kids and grandkids because they are already conversant uh, to a degree and begin to do the kinds of things that we're talking about. But we really need to incentivize some way uh, to do that, and I don't know if there's a, if I've triggered a, a comment from any of you on this, but I, I, I would like to see this conversation uh, continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got one. I don't know if you Go ahead. can't tell if people push it. Um, so we wrestle with this a lot. We, I think, I, th I guess we could all agree that most innovation happens when many buyers can rub up against many sellers and have room to move around. Right? And then the crazy ones try the wacky thing, and pretty soon everyone loves the crazy one, and then everyone's doing that. And then it goes out of fashion, and we move on to the next thing. Right? That's hard when uh, there are a few players. It's hard when, it's, when players get insulated by really hard regulation. So Ann gets through. The FDA is really responsive, but Ann's got capital. She's got cred. It's visible. And the next four Ann's, who, no offense, might have better Ann products, are isolated because they can't make it through that moat. Patients are the same way, uh, Congresswoman Caps. They, they can't yet shop because the product hasn't had product management in a long time. The product has been defined from on high as 6,700 CPT codes defended by 9,400 diagnosis codes, right? Let going to 140,000 diagnosis codes. Well, let me interrupt you because I sure. want you to keep going. But are you designing anything to work with consumers or patients in their... B big time, yeah. Developing applications and digital health tools so that it comes more f as much from them as from you? Yes. So there's two layers, I believe. I don't believe it can happen in one fell swoop, except for, you know, the 23andMe demographic are some super smart, 
sort of, I'm going to look at my DNA. You know, that's not your average bear. They're key because those elite thinkers will drive products forward. But the, the mainstream, right, is going to need a, a spirit guide for a while. And I believe that the spirit guide is the physician. I believe that physicians equipped with the, you know, ACA law or physicians, risk contracts. Just physicians? Or we can't ever get enough of them. Well, let's be clear. Physicians don't shop today at all for but their also, clients. But also, a lot of my constituents... English is not their primary language. Mm -hmm. Great. But I mean, take your mainstream. Forget your tales for a second. Mainstream patients go in for a mammogram, and the doctor will have 10 mammograms available within 20 miles of that patient, and there'll be an 80% price differentiation uh, between them. There'll be a 100% difference in the next available appointment. The doctor won't know any of that. So one layer that will help is if... Product, if doctors shop for patients, then the product will be product managed well enough so that the next generation, the patient will take responsibility from the doctor as the product matures. But one of the things you guys got to think about is, and, and risk contracts do help that because now the doctor can actually make money by picking the best choice where they didn't used to. And it was more like, who's going to kick me out of the golf game if I don't pick them in the referral? Does that make sense that there's these layers that if you, if you teach doctors to shop for care in their patient's behalf, then soon the product will be product managed well enough that patients can shop for their care for mainstream patients. And then elite, thoughtful patients can be shopping for it all the time directly. But getting patients shopping, equipping patients shopping, and allowing the various, yes, business models that allow uh, uh, profit to come from good shopping uh, is something that we are natively, culturally, actually pretty good at uh, as a society and that we can use. We know to wait up in line at midnight around you know, the block for Best Buy when the flat screens are going down in price, but we don't know that we just lost $2,000 choosing a mammogram from an academic medical center that costs uh, 10 times more than the one that's next to my house. So <laughs> teaching that will get those mainstream people access to care that is uh, more affordable and will get the care more digestible so that people can actually start to shop for it with to start to use their intuition to shop for it. Dr. Blatt, did you want to add in? I, I think to answer your question very directly about business models that could happen to empower people who are lower economics in isolated areas, English is not their primary language, innovation is going to occur in those environments. But, but a lot of what happens is those innovations are risky, and they're often by either small companies or large companies sponsoring a smaller company, and the issue around liability and, and the risk-adverse environment that's been created prevents them from actually jumping into these models whole hog. I mean, again, what Anna had to go through to, and what she continues mm -hmm. to have to go through to, to promote just letting citizens choose to get access to this data is, is daunting. So creating an environment that promotes risk, for, uh, as a very specific example. Easier said than done. Well, you it's, do this. ACA does do this. It, and it does create I'm not saying unwanted risk. I'm not saying just abandon, or, you know, let, let the hounds out. But, but let business models thrive that might be orthogonal to what's happening now. What if I actually said to you, uh, using artificial intelligence, cloud-based algorithms, natural language processing, an avatar could actually do an intake interview uh, for a child in a school district that might have a problem and can substitute for a school nurse? Well, I mean, the school district would go crazy about the liability of the avatar. Oh, my God. I mean, at some point, you have to create environments that allow these experiments to start to thrive and grow. None of them are going to be perfect. None of them are going to get it right out of the box. I'm, again, insulate, I'm not suggesting insulating them from all liability, but creating circumstances that promote them and allow things like an avatar for a structured interview using NLP based on algorithms that were designed by experts at the Cleveland Clinic thrive and start to work as a way to lower cost, to give lower socioeconomic people care, but that's different. I hear what you're saying, but there's so many gaps between that image and where I live. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there's, there, there's, some really, there's some really interesting notions that are coming out of it. And Representative Capps and Ann, you should get together because <laughs> what I'd like to do is I'd like to see science education yeah. move to the high schools and think of all the fun things yeah. that Ann's doing. Mm -hmm. And we could teach a class yes. where you could figure out what your ancestry is. You could figure out whether you're allergic to cilantro. Mm -hmm. And that would be fun. I'd take that class. Mm -hmm. 
and my kids would take that class. Uh -huh. And then, you know, you'd have to be careful about the privacy. You and what, start but, before high but, school. Yeah. But you, that would just be fun. <laughs> but I want to come back to a broader issue, which is the issue of consumer engagement and how do we facilitate that. And Anne, Anne made a good point, which is patients want to participate if you tell them, I have somebody that needs your help. We take patient samples from every single one of my leukemia patients in my clinic, and we have them sign a consent. And they have three choices. Can we use your sample for research for anything we think of today, tomorrow, and not contact you? Can we use your sample for something we didn't tell you about in our consent form if we contact you? Or you can never use my sample for anything except what you said in the consent form. Over 95% of our patients will check the box Use it for anything because it's going to help people. That's the same thing that's happening. And so as we think about privacy, are there ways that the, we can think about legislation that allows that to happen in a way that actually facilitates research to get done so that actually we have more access to this data? That would truly ac accelerate our ability to get the research done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pitts. I, thank you. Let's, let's move on to Mr. Pitts. And then... We have several members that still have questions to ask, and then, and then we'll continue to go. There's so much we could talk about. Thank you, uh, Madam Co-Chair. And again, thank you to the presenters. Uh, another very stimulating and informative uh, roundtable. We've had several uh, briefings and roundtables. It's really exciting. <clears throat> and at the first one, I asked uh, about clinical trial networking. I'd like to ask, uh, ask Paul Magelli, uh, um, what role can digital technology play in streamlining and making clinical trials more efficient? What do you, how do you envision the role of uh, digital technology in clinical trials in the future? Thank you very much. Um, what we know about the clinical trials process today is it's hugely inefficient. Right? Um, a big part of that process ultimately is, and I, uh, I've had the opportunity to spend time with many of the largest uh, academic medical centers, and, and those institutions that you think would be doing it, uh, you know, have solved the problem, indeed haven't. And, and one of the fundamental problems is matching. Okay? So it's hard to match a patient with a trial. And somebody, I think Dr. Harris spoke to, um, you know, we've got a national resource in clinicaltrials.gov, so a repository where we curate, uh, at least to some extent, uh, those clinical trials. Th those, however, are not computable yet. You can't actually use what is an inclusion or exclusion criteria. I want all patients with these comorbidities that are, have this age, that haven't had this event in the last six months. You can't take that and apply it to a patient population. And so we're resigned today to largely a manual process in the clinical trials process where even the best institutions which have great data and have great research organizations find it uh, very difficult to put those two together. Um, you know, my sense is a simple investment in uh, clinicaltrials.gov and, and essentially upgrading that, you know, that repository of knowledge as an example would go a long way to allow us to take you know, digital patient records and match them. So um, that would uh, enable the process. And then um, you can imagine, a, in, in a sense, a marketplace developing between the two where um, organizations, uh, whether or not they're device companies, pharmaceutical companies, can much more easily find cohorts, gl potentially globally over time, by framing a, a pilot and then looking broadly across patients everywhere, particularly those that have said, I want to participate or I want to be considered. Um, and physicians at the point of care, through that process, same matching process, can immediately identify whether or not their patient's a candidate for a trial. So it, you know, th that is a uh, you know, sympathetic, it's a, re uh, you know, a self-reinforcing process that will just make that whole process far less costly and uh, far, um, uh, uh, you know, it will it, take all, the time uh, in that process will, uh, will drop dramatically. So uh, tremendous. I'd point out Thank one you. thing about, uh, sorry. And, and I would just take that one step further. The, the same technology that enables the physician to be able to identify the patient who might be a candidate for that trial, you can take that same technology and give it directly to the patient, that they will be able to see themselves that they're qualified for the trial. Today, it's an impossible task for them to do it on them or their own. They're going onto the web, they're doing the searches, they're inefficient, they're missing half of the programs that, that would be available to them. By empowering the patient again, giving them that um, option, 
uh, to use this tool directly, I think will drive this cycle even faster. And I, I just come back and make one modification to John's model about um, getting the doctors to do the shopping. I, I think, again, that the marketplace is ready, that if the, the organizations uh, like the Cleveland Clinic shouldn't be responsible for doing the shopping, we should be responsible for providing the tools that allows the patient to do the shopping um, right from our site. We have core information. We have the, the insurance information. We could put all of that together and let them shop in the most efficient way. And at the end of the day, then what we would be doing as the Cleveland Clinic is not competing on how we can control the information. What we should be held to is competing on what we could do with the information if you choose us as your health care facility. Uh, I think one business model or technology paradigm that's important to get you guys around is the notion of software-enabled service or cloud-based technology companies versus sort of enterprise software companies. So 95% of healthcare is still operating on enterprise software that sits in isolated institutions. And so the really big institutions actually look pretty good at coordinating because they were able to put a lot of the healthcare supply chain on one copy of software. They can't go across town very easily, but they can go around their own institutions better. Everywhere else in society, uh, you know, you put type ice age into Amazon, and Amazon will do 256 web services calls to 256 servers, 50% of which aren't even owned by Amazon, to pull everything that Amazon can give you about ice age, including some competitive information into one screen. That's normal for us everywhere, and it's very rare in healthcare. I believe that once the High Tech Act washes through and all this meaningful use stuff washes through, nobody will buy enterprise software-based EMRs unless the government somehow props them up again. We, used to, we called it the Sonny Von Bulow bill when you guys did that because it was keeping these dead companies alive. But if, 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 we got, if, we, if we let healthcare move over time, and you could talk about this because I know you were very early and there was only the choice of enterprise software, but we got 56 million patients on Athena. Now we can do a trial qualification in 10 minutes. We can't do anything with it until we go and get permission from all those patients. But we've got four or five Kaiser Permanentes sitting in one database, which is a collective of 52,000 doctors from solo practices to academic medical centers. And we're not special. I think that over time, everyone will go to uh, cloud-based business models. And this data aggregation problem that currently exists, where you know, the data and the building are the same, um, will, will go away as long as we don't stop it. It's a, it's a good and natural flow. Thank you. I, I think we, what we're hearing is a lot of interesting discussion about the notion of, yeah, sure, the, the notion of consumerism. And for the equation of consumerism to work, I think a few things have to be in place. You, you have to have the notion of choice. So giving the ability and engaging people, we've, we've been taught to be passive about our care. It's something that happens to us. We're not informed because we don't have the transparency. So Pro promoting the notion of the visibility to your information, but also quality and value so that as you exercise that choice, you're motivated to go to a place where you get that. And then there's, of course, a notion of accountability where there sh people should feel some responsibility because a lot of the choices that we can make promote that. In the equation, there's a, a buy side and the sell side. And so on, on the selling or the providing side, the notion of accountability, too, I think is an important shift that's playing out. We're just started on that. We've, we've, our system has been one that's paid for volume and not sufficiently for value. So that same notion of transparency of information is also going to be an important equation. And many of the things that I think we're all in a position to do at, at at all levels of entrepreneurialism in terms of bringing forward capability can be oriented towards helping make those interactions a more fulfilling interaction. And so consumerism is something that we're absolutely for, and so that notion of transparency to support it, uh, choice and accountability will, I, help, I think, help promote and accelerate. Representative Gingrey. Uh, Diana, thank you. I appreciate what you and Fred have done in putting together this 21st century Cures Digital Health Care. Uh, there are some brilliant men and women uh, in this room. I think we're getting probably to the phase of the, uh, the, the hearing of uh, drowning the fish, uh, and uh, you see people uh, beginning to leave. But 
You know, I think uh, the bottom line with all of this, and I'm all, I'm all for digital health care. I, I fully embrace electronic uh, medical records. I have practiced medicine for 30 years before I got here 12 years ago, uh, and it was basically primary care for women, uh, my specialty. Uh, and, and I think it is very important that we, we get to this point in time. But the problem in regard to what Congress can do, uh, it's, it's a privacy issue, I think, that people are so concerned about because Congresses and administrations for a while now, and I'm not pointing my finger at, at any party, uh, have been snooping and leaking of any and everything for political advantage. And that could, unfortunately, include health care information that's very sensitive uh, whether or not you as an individual uh, were being treated for ADHD or bipolar disease or anxiety disorder, something that you didn't want anybody else to know about except you and your doctor because you didn't want to be discriminated against. Uh, I read an article just recently uh, from uh, where the American Bar Association had made a decision that trial attorneys could query social network information uh, that some of you uh, Gen Xers or millennials that use this stuff a lot, uh, and they could use that information to actually strike a jury pool based on, on what they've found out about you uh, the day before a, a trial. Now, you think about that, that if you put something on a, on a social website uh, in some uh, firm uh, or somebody that works for a trial attorney could look and query that information even though you haven't friended them uh, and strike you from a jury pool that you might very well want to serve on. So you take that same thing and you transfer it to medicine, how much more scary is that? Uh, so uh, I, again, I, I think this is fantastic. I've learned a lot. Uh, you have gotten way over my head. You have drowned this fish uh, uh, maybe 30 minutes ago. Uh, but I did want to make this comment because the American people, patients, uh, before they're going to embrace this, they've got to trust that we're not going to continue to leak information about them uh, to, for, for whatever nefarious purpose it might be. And we've seen a lot of that in the press. Now, you, you all know of what I'm speaking uh, and, and so, you know, it's this current administration, but it could be any administration. It could be any Congress. So I have great concerns about that. If anybody wants to comment on it, fine, and I'll yield back. But let, me, let me just say it's not just leaking information. I mean, the privacy issues are real because it's not just leaking information for political reasons, but the job issues and other kinds of issues for regular people. So th I think that's an excellent question for the panel to talk about is how do you balance this um, this um, desire for patients to have their information and to have their pa families, but also to stop inappropriate use of information, because that's the balance we've always been trying to achieve, and what it's sounding like you all don't think we really have found that. So uh, I'd like to offer you know, an, an observation from the vantage point of, uh, of a venture capitalist, because I do part of that and watching the many small companies that really don't go forward because once they understand the HIPAA penalties and the machinery involved uh, and the limitation that that imposes on the value that they could create, that they demure. And I, I think our healthcare system is worse. It's poorer because of the, the absence of that innovative spirit when it encounters that immovable object that we currently call HIPAA. I think, you know, when, when, with, uh, with, with Snowden, I think many people wound up believing that uh, privacy and security is past. It's not something that we can, we do well enough to be able to defend it. You know, when I moved to San Diego, I bought my house over my iPhone, right? Because the notion that I was going to make the biggest purchase of my life using, using software, which I believed was good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. When, when in April there was a survey done of patients and 90% said they'd be willing to share their health care information and only a quarter or even less than a quarter said they had um, real concerns about privacy. Perhaps we, in, in our effort to protect the patients, 
are constructing a health care system that they and we cannot afford, and we're putting the balance in the wrong spot. You know, I think, I think as we walk around this room, there is this notion that people do want to help. They do want to add the phenotype to Anne's genotype so that our kids won't struggle with the same diseases we have. We will have that data shared. And so as in, in, in Congress's view of trying to protect everyone from that information, we may be protecting them to death. And, and I'm not sure that's the end point that we would choose. At the same time, I, I do think you, right now, so everybody, patient, goes to any doctor on Athena net, they got to sign the HIPAA form. And it's all defaulted to yes. And 99.9, .9, you know, other than like 11 professional athletes a month, everybody says fine, right? But there will potentially come a day when they say, woo, you know, and then it's all out there and it's scary. Uh, I know that we're now getting it so that a patient who's got multiple doctors on Athena net can see all those doctors' charts through one window. So they can say, bring in, you know, my cardiologist or bring in my... Uh, and they want that. But when we add that, I just want to add, I'm going to add a delete button too. So that if they get, and, and not so much for privacy like the jury thing, which could happen, but just what if you're just mad at them? What if you just feel like you were treated wrong, disrespected, you're furious? Um, because there is not a lot of recourse for patients, particularly the 9% of patients that get sick in some way, to, to, to activate consumer passion. Uh, and so the ability to say, you know what, my claims are paid, I have nothing to do with you, I'm deleting you, and I'm uploading to another doctor, and goodbye. Um, both the ability to port your information, but also to be able to cut out health providers who have shaken your trust as an active consumer, to me, seem like a good idea. I, I don't know if it has to be a law, but I, I do feel like the more connected we get things, right now, if you're connected, you're already under one brand, right? If you're connected, it's because you're at the Cleveland Clinic and everybody's, you know, they're only using other Cleveland Clinic guys. That's not going to last, right? People are going to be at Minute Clinic and Retail Clinic, Target and Walmart. And then the ability to activate consumer rage will be more complicated. And so I think maybe thinking about it, and I know we want to do it just to protect our own brand. Yeah. Anyone else? Dr. Drucker. Ultimately, you're going to have to decide what is it that you're trying to prevent because the reality is that this information is going to get out there. And the reality is you can go to Starbucks and I can go in after you and I can take that cup and send it to Ann and she can sequence your DNA and I know who you are. So what are we trying to prevent? And so we, want, we don't want this data to be used for nefarious purposes. We have to make that very, very clear. But we also have to liberate that same data so we can get cures to people faster. And we have to strike that balance somehow. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're asking for some help with. Yeah, I had one more comment on this. Um, I mean, one of the things that we've, we've tried to do um, with 23andMe is actually really put the data ownership in, in the hands of the, in, in the individual, the consumer. So for instance, I would challenge everybody here also, if you have your medical records, do you know who they're shared with? And if you were ever at an academic institution and you signed that academic institution usually consent form and they have the right to share your data sort of with anyone, you know, do you know where your data went? And so when I had my child, for instance, at Stanford, I was one of those annoying people who like ripped up the whole consent form because it was like, we're going to take photos, we're going to do everything, we're going to share them, you don't know where, and we'll never, we'll never let you know. I said, no. So it's the opposite for 23andMe. We actually want to engage individuals and say, it's your data. If you want to share it, you control who you're going to share it with. And, and actually let that transparency, because I do believe that people want to share their information, but you just want to know who it's being shared with, and you want to have that control, and you do want to be able to not share it at certain times. And I think it's, you know, one of the challenges we have is it's, it's actually just hard to get, it's hard to do that right now. It's hard to actually yeah. get your information. And, and one of the things I would, which actually surprisingly has not come up here, one of the things the government actually has done that I think is significant is the blue button. And being able to get your data, I mean, Blue Button Initiative says essentially everyone in this room should be able to get their medical records. But I bet no one in this room actually has yet. And so we need to actually make it an easy process. And I think once it's in the hands of the consumers, the consumers will want to know and have a really clear transparency about how, who they're sharing it with. And I think to your point, Dr. Drucker, is actually severe penalties if it's not being used appropriately. And let me interrupt you just for a second on that, because as I understand HIPAA, uh, uh, a patient can 
allow the sharing of, of that information, all they have to do is just tell their, their provider, look, it's okay to share my information uh, with my dad or, or with my, my sister uh, and, and name names. Uh, but I think most providers are really out there seeing patients trying to cure disease and hopefully trying to prevent disease. Uh, th they don't really understand that. And they're, they're scared to death that they're going to get uh, some inspector general uh, visiting and looking at 50 charts or whatever and put them in jail potentially after a severe uh, a fine. Uh, I mean, you, you're, you're, the, the doctors, the providers don't know. And somehow they need to understand that uh, if I call uh, uh, my, my daughter's physician and I say, look, I've observed some things that really concern me and I want you to know, uh, and I'm going to give you this information. You don't have permission in this case to share with me her treatment regimen and what she has been telling you. But you can listen to me because I'm observing. You know, I know, and, he, and this may save her a life, uh, but doctors won't even return your call, a family member, because they think that they'll be violating uh, HIPAA rules. How do we get beyond that? How do we explain and make them understand that that's perfectly okay to still listen to a family member? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I need to go to Representative Lance, and then, and then he's going to have the last question. If we have some time, we can finish up. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, very much, and uh, I want to commend you, uh, Congresswoman DeGette, on uh, doing an excellent job at this hearing. And I think it demonstrates that in so many ways, this committee works in a bipartisan fashion. Um, I think the public should recognize that <clears throat> more bills have reached the president's desk in this session from this committee than any other committee of the Congress. And the bills that have reached the president's desk and have been signed into law have been bipartisan in nature. And to Chairman Upton and to you, uh, this has been an excellent forum, as the previous forum was an excellent forum. Uh, I speak as both a lawyer and as a legislator, I guess that makes me exponentially at the bottom of every poll in, <laughs> poll in America. Uh, Congress is by nature both reactive and in its best uh, days proactive. And I think we can uh, solve this uh, challenge together. And the question for me, a legal question, based upon the procedure of moving forward, on the substantive issue of, of the digital advances in medicine is how we should improve upon HIPAA and related statutory law. And certainly we want the greatest privacy possible for the American people. We also want the American people to be able to share information as they see fit. And um, <clears throat> not everyone would have the expertise or the talent or the ability uh, to uh, stayed out at Stanford that I don't want my information uh, to uh, uh, go beyond where I would like it to go. Many of our constituents are not as sophisticated as the distinguished panelists in this room are. And so my question or comment would be to the panel, how in your opinion should we update uh, procedural statutes like HIPAA and related statutes to move ahead not only in a reactive but a proactive fashion so that substantively we can get to where we all want to go, the better health of the American people. In, in many ways, I think the best um, uh, fiduciary for your health care data is yourself. Um, creating an environment where it's easy to get the data or actually even mandatory that I give you the data. I commend you recently on passing legislation or regulation that allowed us to have access to lab data. I mean, it was kind of daunting to me that states actually forbid you from viewing your own lab data. What other product are you required to purchase? And if you don't, I'll sue you and pay for it, and you're not allowed to see lab data. I mean, you at least democratized that. You said it had to go to citizens. You put a 30-day hold on it, which might mitigate some of its usefulness. If a requirement was set forth that data had to be handed to the patient, actionable data in a reasonable time frame, and the patient became the center of that data, then I wouldn't be holding the data in 60 different repositories. And I wouldn't be actually having to out and gather the data. I would mitigate all those complications and that interoperability issue 
you become the focus. And that could be done uh, presumably by amending statutory law or perhaps by administrative rule and regulation. But I, I, Again, I'm not a lawyer, sir. But, but I would I, imagine it would be in, I, admi uh, amending statutory law. But putting that patient in the center, in the focus, allowing their parent to act for them, um, whether the data is genomic data, IoT data, EMR data, imaging data. Imaging data might be a really good place to start with. Imaging data is some of the most important clinical data that a clinician sees regardless. And we know that's available digitized for the most part in the cloud right now. And it can be transmitted. But again, HIPAA places a daunting restriction on it. If we should work hold, together to overcome these challenges. If you hold the data, it's not PHI. You are not a covered entity. You can do what you want with the data. That would be a mechanism, I think, at least, for moving forward. Thank you. There, there are actually some mechanisms already in place, and Mr. Bush talked a little bit about meaningful use. This is where you can actually meaning, meaningful use useful. Um, where actually, I'm actually, um, I'm actually looked at every week how many after visit summaries do I print for my patients or have them access to it on, on their electronic chart. Um, we actually include all their laboratory data on that after visit summary and we include their x-rays on that after visit summary as well. But if I was, I was analyzed on how often do I do that as a physician, there actually is a mechanism to actually in Medicare, Medicaid regulations, we can actually, you could actually legislate that. Thank you. And, and actually then reimburse us for doing that. Actually, it is in the law, but you waived it. So it was part of stage two of meaningful use that you had to present uh, a patient's visit online, and then you waived. Then you, you also had to move 10% of your patients from one hospital to another or outside of your health system, which allows for liquidity of information and prevents sort of monopoly pricing. And those got moved down to only move one patient, to move one patient to a dummy server, to you don't have to move them at all. And that's law that you've got, and you're paying out the $30 billion. I mean, if it were me, I'd be like, well, if we're going to pay the $30 billion, let's at least make the part of the law that we all did pass actually be required. I'm just thinking out loud. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Thank you. So we've come to the... Um, end of our time, but um, this is an informal roundtable. Is there anybody who has something burning to add to the cause? Okay. Well, um, now that uh, I want to thank all of the panelists. This was a fabulous discussion, even better than we thought it would be. And uh, we're going to take all of your ideas. Uh, we now are deputizing you as official um, uh, sources for our endeavors as we go forward. So I hope you're willing to undertake those activities. If you have specific suggestions for this panel, as with anyone else here in the room, if you have specific suggestions for us how we can address these issues, please supplement your um, uh, testimony and your answers in writing because we are taking all of this into account as we move forward. I know Chairman Upton would uh, join with me in thanking you for a wonderful discussion and, and we really appreciate you appearing. It's a big help. Thank you.